Good morning, everyone. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and good morning to those online. It's good to have everyone together. And I like the spacing. Wonderful. I'd like to read Psalm 100. Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him, singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever. And his faithfulness continues to each generation. Such good words for us to begin this morning. Lord, we thank you for bringing us together. Thank you that you're with us, that you walk with us, that you speak to us, and we together will hear from you today. Amen. And I will turn this over to musicians. Good morning, everyone. Let's stand together.
let's just turn to our neighbor and greet one another this morning. Well, let's stand back up and sing our next couple songs. <laughs> Oh, 
this oath is covenanted blood. Support me in the well-made flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Thank you, you may be seated. We have announcements. I believe they're going to come up. There we go. Coffee and brown bug lunches are welcomed after church if you wish to stay and visit with people here. And um, I'm going to just pass this over to Hannah right now. <laughs> nice tag team. <laughs> so coffee, you can come early in the morning, uh, fellowship with us, make some friends. We're usually here around 10. Brown bag lunches, you're more than welcome to stay as long as you'd like afterwards. Invite a few people to stay with you. Invite some to join. If you don't plan for it, you can order in. It's all good. Um, the door is set up so it will lock behind you, so you don't have to worry about that either. iKids is a summer camp that's offered by another local church. We're just advertising that it's there. If you want more information about it, please uh, check our website out, and you can find information about their website. April 7th, which is today, we have Caleb Him sing at 7 o'clock tonight. Um, if you want to help out or you're planning on going, you'd like more information on that, we do it monthly. Um, please check with Amira. Ladies Bible study, we've been bouncing around a little bit over the summer. We're supposed to be meeting weekly, but it's summer, so we're meeting monthly. Our next meeting is going to be on August 16th here at the church at 7 p.m. You're more than welcome to come. You don't have to um, have been coming regularly. It's kind of sort of one that's available to drop in. And we're going to be looking at the book of John. So pre-homework is reading through the book of John. If you don't have time and you want to come, come anyway. Um, <clears throat> August 21st is our next manor service That's from that starts at 2.30, and I know Pastor Grant would love help with that, so if you have the ability to go and help just with the residents or be support, um, kind of like we have here a little bit for him, that would be wonderful. Um, August 28th, we're having another, we're having communion here, that's our regular monthly communion, and then we're having potluck afterwards. Potluck is very informal. Bring what you feel like you want to bring, bring a little extra for somebody else stick around and visit. It's all good. We've been working on doing technology updates, and last week I did quite a bit on those that have technology or prefer it. This week I'd like to focus on those that don't have technology. If you don't have an email address or you prefer not to use technology to receive information from the church, please let us know. We will either make sure that you get a printed copy of the weekly bulletin in your mailbox or give you a mailbox so you know where to find one. Um, we also have our monthly calendars available. I'm not sure if Pastor Grant sent them out this week, but there will be a PDF for August coming out, and there's a few printed copies out on the front. Um, women's ministry. Uh, we're planning on doing just a general ladies' free gathering here in the fall, but they're also starting up the Women's Journey of Faith again. And if those of you who don't know what that is, um, it's a rather large conference in Saskatoon, and I'm not saying that we're going to organize a group, but if you want to go, I think it would be good if a group of us went. So, you know, just let me know. The tickets are available now. Um, there'll be more information going out this week by email. And um, there are advanced ticket pricing or preferred pricing for advanced tickets. So, you know, if you want to get on the ball game with that, go ahead. That's kind of all we have to say. Oh, it's November 4th. Sorry. Thank you, Ruth. November 4th and 5th is a weekend for the Women's Journey of Faith. So, alrighty. Thank you. Oh, I'm Hannah, by the way. Thanks, Anna, and Pastor Lloyd is speaking today. Welcome.
here we go. Yes. Yes, yes. And I even thought to myself before, don't forget to turn it on. Well, as we come this morning, I invite us first to engage with the Lord. That's the first place we need to be, even before we come to a service of any sort on a Sunday morning, is to engage in that relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, who will lead us to our Heavenly Father, whom it will engage the Holy Spirit to speak the word of truth and the word of God into our lives. Let's pray together. Father, as we come, we open our hearts. We ask you, Lord, to speak into our lives this day. Lord, you know where each and every one of us is in our relationship with you, uh, in our walk with you. you. You know what our needs are to the very core of our being. And we do pray that you will speak today and help us as your children, as followers in Jesus Christ, to offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice, which is holy, which is pleasing to you, because that is our real worship. It's not just us coming here to gather on a Sunday morning. It's a 24-7 event of worship is that relationship we have with you and how we live our life, how we exalt your name, how we praise you. That is worship. So, Lord, be with us today. We pray and speak. Amen. You've noticed a different seating arrangement. Uh, Pastor Grant, that, I mean, we had a conversation last week after service when he said, literally, and I affirm this, he is trying to help us gather together more, to get closer to one another. We spent two years being separated. He wants us to have fellowship with one another as well. Henceforth, that's why he rearranged the chairs. So I, I really affirm that because I believe that's the right direction to go for the body of Christ, for us getting together here today. Well, today, the message is called God's plans versus our plans. How many of us have come into moments in our lives where we have all of a sudden, the light has gone on, bing, and we've discovered that we were doing something for God all on our own, in our own strength, in our own ability, and trying to forge ahead to make uh, a ministry for God. Have you ever done that? You'll get there, trust me. I have. I have. I remember just in the past as I, as I ponder and as I think back, the numbers of times when I would go to like a, a church seminar. Ever been to a churchy seminar? Where they, they lay out some plans for us, where they lay out some strategies and principles and say, if you do this and that and this, and it'll glorify God. It'll draw people into the body of Christ. And then you go home to your church setting and you try and do those things and... I'm sure God must go, oh, not again. <sighs> I've done it, been there, done that. I don't know how many times I failed to count and <laughs> frustrated my wife to all ends because you come back and you're all excited about what God is going to do and how he's going to change everything. That's not of God. That's a man thing. That's a human thing. Basically based on our need to control what God does and how God works. Well, that's not the design that is laid out for us in the Word of God. We as believers in Christ have a, a very particular challenge that is constantly in front of us. We as churches have a challenge that is in front of us. The same challenge. 
The challenge is simply this. Do we follow God's plan or do we choose to follow our own plan? Do we make things up? Do we conjure things? Do we try and force God into certain little cubby holes, button holes? Do we try and get God to do it our way? And as I said, I'm as guilty as guilty can be on that one. Done it before. You know, one of the, the revolutionary things is to begin to understand the factors, the things that are involved here. We start to ask questions. How much do I trust in God? How much do I, do I sincerely trust that God has uh, my best interest, your best interest, His interests in the front part of his mind. Another question, do I really believe God will, will orchestrate and do things according to his own plan and his own will? Do I believe it? Am I willing to allow my life to reflect that? And we have to ask the question, what are my desires in this? Because our desires always come into this relationship with Jesus Christ. And sometimes, I have found about myself anyway, I don't know about you, that it's I want what I want and when I want it. It's me saying to God, give me this. That's not how God operates. Another question, am I willing to set aside what I want what I think, what I feel, and my own reason in order to follow God's direction? Am I willing to set that aside? The issue is surrendering self and submitting to God's lordship over everything. Not just some things, everything. Everything. Which includes, I mean, our personal life, our personal situations, the, the body of Christ and, and the work of the body of Christ that God calls us to. Another question, can I admit God knows better than I do about what he wants? Can I bring my heart, my mind, my very soul into that place of, of accepting, God, you know what you're doing. You've got it in control. I don't have to worry about that. Do I believe God has a plan? And, and he wants me to join him in what he is doing. You see, what we do frequently in churches and in personal lives is that we often come up with a plan and then we invite God to be part of that plan, which is backwards. That's absolutely backwards. That's based on human thinking, human reasoning, and it's not how God works. He comes up with a plan and wants us to follow His plan. Am I willing to be dependent on God? Now, this brings up the question of all of us like our independence. We live in a society here in North America where uh, independence... Individualism is hammered into us from the point we are little children. We like that. And so we grow up and we come to Christ and we even walk into the church and we demand that sense of independence. Give me what I want. This is what God should want. The way I want. But it's different than that. And the last question I pose, and there's many, many questions. I've just made up a list as I was praying and just think, God, how do we have to self-reflect on this? Am I willing to set aside my fears? That's a biggie. As we found through the pandemic, fear has been the motivator. Fear, anxiety, the fear for self. All of these things. Fear is a powerful thing that will either hold us back or it can even push us ahead if it's allowed to. <coughs> One of the foundational things 
and we're going to get to our scriptures here shortly. One of the foundational things that helped me was doing the study, a Bible study called Experiencing God. A number of you have done that study. And I'll never forget the numbers of people saying, I've been a believer for 30, 40 years, and I didn't know this. Wow. Yeah. It's a wonderful study, and you got to focus on the Scripture. And it's a very scripturally based study. But the seven basic realities that are brought forward in this is God is always at work around me. God is always at work around you. All of us. God is busy doing his work. He just is. That's what God does. And we see that witness throughout the scriptures. God is busy doing his work. Jesus joined the Father in doing his work. Jesus had to lay aside himself and he had to follow the Father, and the Father guided and directed Jesus while he lived on this earth. That took sacrifice on Jesus' part. The second reality is God pursues a continuing love relationship with each of us that is real and it is personal. It is. That's the reality. The third reality is that God invites me to become involved with him in his work. There's a key. There's a key element right there. God invites each and every believer and follower of Christ to get involved with God's plan, with what God is doing, not necessarily what churches do. Well, as I said, often churches are doing their own thing in their own way, and that's not what God asks of us. It's not. The fourth reality is God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, through prayer, through circumstances, and through the body of Christ. He speaks to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. That's part of the picture that we need to understand and follow. And God invites me and you to work with him and uh, always he always leads me to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action he leads me up to a point where i have to choose am i going to follow god or am i going to keep doing things my own way fulfilling my own plan what am i going to do <coughs> and to follow god requires faith and action, and just as James wrote about in the book of James, faith and deeds, faith and actions go together. You cannot have one without the other. When we say we have faith, James said, and it's not revealed by our actions, we really don't have faith. We, we do our own thing. And that's one of the questions that really comes up. The sixth reality I must make major adjustments in my life to join God in what He is doing. Okay? I have to be ready. I have to be available. I have to allow my life to be changed, to be adjusted, to conform to God's plan, to God's will. And it's got nothing to do with people's plan for me or for you. It's God's plan. I have to be willing to make those adjustments. And when I make those adjustments and walk then in obedience and faith, God works in incredible, amazing ways. And the seventh reality is I come to know God by experience. Experience as I obey Him and He accomplishes His work through me. I don't know how many times over the years I've prayed, God use me. But then I put a caveat on there and say, well, God, I'm going to do this for you. And I ask you to bless this that I'm doing. You see, following Jesus isn't just about doing things for God. It's way bigger. It's way more intense 
it's way more personal for each and every one of us. Now, God calls his people and the church to follow him in what he is doing. We've just emphasized that over and over. And uh, that's all around us at all times. It's not just Sunday morning. It's 24-7. It's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And just repeats every day. That's the goal. And in God's plan, there is success and reward. In our plan, I pulled these flowers from the front there this morning because I noticed these flowers are starting to wilt. Now, we can come up with a good human plan, and it may look good to start with, but you know what happens? Things start to fall apart. It starts to wilt. It starts to fade because it is not based on the will and the plan and the purposes of God. And that's the thing. We can start any ministry that we want to start, but unless it's of God, it will fade. It will wither. It will fall apart. The key is God's plan and not just our own plan. Now, in speaking of plans, here we come to the Scripture. In Judges 6, verses 11 through 16, most of us are probably fairly familiar with this accounting in the Scripture uh, of Gideon. And Gideon wasn't anybody special, really. I mean, he was the least in the tribe of Joash and, and just the least in the family, the youngest of the family. I mean, did he really matter? No, he didn't. Not according to human standards. You see, there's the difference, the human thinking, the human mind, the human reasoning. But God saw in Gideon something that God needed. I believe he saw Gideon would be faithful. I believe he saw that Gideon would honor him no matter how hard it was. And that actually uh, became true. Judges 6, 11 through 16 to start with. I'll read it off of there. It's easier. The angel of the Lord. Now, the Israelites, the Midianites had moved in and taken over the land. And they were just consuming all of the crops, everything that they grew. They come in and took it all or destroyed it. And the Israelites cried out to God and said, God, help us. You did so in Egypt. We ask you to come and help us. This is God's response. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah uh, that belonged to Joash, the Abizrite, there we go, where the son of Gideon, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Right there, he's identifying who Gideon really is as a man of God. When the angel, whoops, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? Ever ask that question of God? I think we all have. You know, where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, uh, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of the Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Oh boy! God says, Hey, it's you I want. I'm sending you to go. Gideon says, pardon me, my Lord, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. You see, that's the game changer. God said, go, I will be with you. I will go with you. That's the key element for us. 
as followers of Christ, as believers in Christ, Jesus has promised to go with us. Do we believe it? Do we accept it? Jesus has given us a mission. And it's very straightforward. Go therefore out into the world. That's what he told us to do. That's his plan. How often do we do the plan? Probably not as often as we should, right? We get distracted. We get doing other things. We start planning and doing things for God instead of that. And all of the other things that get involved. Gideon had choices here. As we all do. Gideon had choices. To follow God's direction or listen to himself and all the other voices around him. Because you can bet that when Gideon started sharing this, other people probably said, it doesn't say this in the scripture, but we know people. People say, oh, no, I, I don't think so. Get, look at you. You know, we're the weakest, uh, you know, part of this tribe. You're the least in the family. I mean, people add up the negatives. And they start discouraging us. Now, we know who is ultimately behind that, right? Satan discourages Christians from making themselves available to follow God. Satan is the whisperer. Satan is the liar. Satan is the deceiver. Satan is the manipulator. And he uses people to do it. That's the reality. So Gideon had these voices, but Gideon chose to listen to God's voice and not all the other voices. Also, the other thing, Gideon's human reasoning would have been working against his obedience and uh, in following God. We like it when things just make sense to us, don't we? Oh, I can do that. Oh, that makes sense to me. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, I have these abilities, and you know I can employ those abilities to, to accomplish what God has asked me to do. It's easiest for us because then we can depend on ourselves. And that's not what God asks us to do. He doesn't ask us to depend on ourself, what we think, what we believe, what we are able to do. That's not what He asks us. But we all do it every day, don't we? We do. You know, and I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just trying to express this is a reality that we as believers have to wrestle with, we have to deal with, and we have to confront. We do. But this human thinking, human reasoning, again, is what we are taught from infancy. It's about you. It's about you getting what you want. That's not what it's about. It's about God getting what He desires. In us, through us. Yes. And as I said, I've uh, <laughs> I've done a lot of this myself. And oh, yeah, 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 yeah. let's read the next portion here from Judges. And again, that is uh, Judges seven one through eight. Okay, so here's what happened. Early in the morning, Jerubel, there's a reason for that. You can figure that out if you read the rest of chapter 6. That is Gideon and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. Now, we have to understand this in the context that valley filled by Midianites was filled with like a hundred thousand men. Hundred thousand. Yeah. And uh, we find out that Gideon, when he put out the call, he had 32,000 Israelites respond to that call to go fight against the Midians. I don't know what you think, but I don't think those are very fair numbers. 100,000, 32,000. That's how our human brain thinks, right? Okay, God said to, to Gideon, he says, you have too many men. 
I cannot deliver Midian into their into your hands, or Israel would boast against me. Ooh. My own strength has saved me, they would say. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men basically packed their bags and left, while 10,000 remained. Okay, so now the odds are 10 to 1. Ooh, it's looking a little overwhelming. It's looking a little scary to us. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water and I will thin them out. <laughs> thin them out for you there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. Okay. So Gideon took the men down to the water and there the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues, otherwise those that get down on their hands and knees and suck out of the stream as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink and those that drank from cupped hands, those who reached down and were observant or watching what was going on and they drank out of their cupped hands. 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs, but the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lap, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go free. Whoa. Okay. Now the odds have just got even greater against Gideon and his men. But the factor that has been left out is the Lord God Almighty. And He is the one we too frequently leave out of the picture because we get scared. Remember how I said fear controls us? Fear manipulates us? Fear keeps us away from doing God's plan, God's will? This is a story that is meant to encourage us that God is able. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. This is a story that helps us to understand that God is all powerful, that God is always able to accomplish his plan and his will. And so when God says, I want you to come with me and join me in what I'm doing, it's up to God. It's not up to us. And too often we are so selfish, we think it's up to us. It's all about me. Well, no, it's not. It's all about God. Yes, it is. That's the way it's supposed to be. So God commanded Gideon to reduce the number of men from 32,000 down to 300. This demonstrates for us five biblical principles that I want to go through. The first one is that only God's presence and activity can ensure victory and success for his people. If we leave God out or simply God bless this instead of doing it God's way, we tend to fail. We tend to wither and die, you know, like those flowers. It may look good to start with, but then it withers and dies and the flowers, and the petals and the leaves fall off. God is able to work mightily through a, a, a small number of dedicated people. Again, in Zechariah 4, 6, we read these words, It is not by might nor by power, but it is by my Spirit, says the Lord. God says, it is not about you. It is not about me. It's about Him. And it's about Him working, as opposed to me working. God asked me to join Him in what He's doing. That's what He asks. 
And that's what I'm responsible for. And he is the one who's responsible for the outcome. The second truth is spiritual alertness and dedication to God's will and commitment are of the primary importance to God. Those things are important to God. Spiritual alertness, dedication, and commitment. Revelation 3, 4, and 5 says this. And again here, God is overviewing the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And he is, He's judging them. Don't kid yourself. He's judging them. He said, I command this church. There's two churches. He totally commanded. And all the other five churches, God said, well, I like this. But you have this and this and this and this that you need to deal with. You need to do things differently. And the church in Sardis is mentioned here. He says, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. Means they, they have chosen to follow God and not just follow themselves and do wrong. They will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy. He who overcomes will like them be dressed in white. I will never blot his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. Those who commit themselves to follow God will be honored by our Lord Jesus Christ before the Father. Those who commit themselves just to do it God's way, following God and God's plan, will be blessed by God, will be successful. The third truth. Our ultimate resource and strength to serve God and to deal with all of life's challenges can be found in God and in God alone. We are too self-dependent. Again, I said it. What I think, what I want, what I desire too often, or what I fear too often overshadows what I'm willing to do for God. Philippians 4.13 says this, and I've mentioned it already, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. Who do we rely on? Who do we look to? Not to the pastor, folks. Nope, nope, nope. That's wrong. We look to Jesus. The pastor there is to, to teach, to enable, to equip, to help us in a sense of vision and direction for the body of Jesus. That's the pastor's role. But we are to look to Jesus. We are to draw strength and courage from Jesus. Not from somebody else. The fourth truth. Pride in our own abilities and our accomplishments inevitably becomes a hindrance to receiving God's guidance and help. Pride is a dangerous thing. It's on the list of the seven deadly sins that God laid out. Pride is right there in Proverbs 8.13. It says, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. I, the Lord, hate pride and arrogance, evil behaviors and perverse speech. How prideful is it for us to think we can do it on our own? That's horribly prideful. God says, that's, a, that's an absolute sin before him. We need to depend on God. We, we need to spend that time in prayer and seeking and asking God and saying, God, what is your plan? What, what do you want of us? What do you want of me? And, and just follow God in this. And not just do things the way we want to do them. The last truth, the fifth truth. God works through our weakness and inability in order to reveal himself. You know how many people don't serve God because they're aware of their weaknesses? They don't feel they can serve because, oh, I'm not good enough. Oh, I don't have those abilities. Uh, you know, we, we come up with excuses, just like Moses did. We have excuses that we, we, we conjure up in order to step back and step away. That's what we do. I've all I've done it. You've done it. We've all done it. 
We make excuses. But just as God said in the beginning, in, in when Gideon identified his weakness, being of the weakest tribe and the youngest, the weakest of the family, God said, hey, that's what I want. I want to use weakness so that you don't go out and brag about what you have done. There's nothing worse. That's pride. That's arrogance in God's eyes that we do something for him and then go brag. Oh, look what we have done. Oh, God needs to be honored and glorified and uplifted in everything we do. Everything. The focus needs to be God. And that's why God whittled their numbers down to 300 because with 300 against 100,000, there's no question that this was God. And that's what God wanted. He used their weakness of those men who were willing to dedicate themselves to him even in fear of death, but none of them died. And God did an incredible work and sent an incredible message to us today. What should we do? Oh, hey, no, I want to read this. The Apostle Paul, when talking about his own, thinking through his own inability, his own weaknesses, his own tribulation. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10, Paul, talking about these afflictions he had, he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I've got this highlighted and circled in my Bible because I found it to be true. My weakness, your weakness, is an instrument for God to work in His power by His grace. Wow, hallelujah. And he said, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. How many of us can say that? We like to hide our weaknesses, right? Just so nobody notices, so nobody can pick at us, so nobody can criticize us. Paul here is saying, hey, I delight in my weaknesses in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. And he draws it to a conclusion. He says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Because God is working, not him. You see, in our weaknesses, it's not us. God uses weaknesses to reveal himself, to reveal his power and his might, his majesty and all of those things. So what should we do? Well, we need to put our trust and confidence in God. I think that's a good place to go. I think we need to allow our faith and our actions to become one with each other. I say I believe in God. I say I believe in the power of God. Well, everything in my life needs to conform to that so that my faith and my actions, my deeds are one. One. And there's no separation. We need to place ourselves under the lordship of Jesus Christ in every situation we are in. Now, this takes humility, folks. Because sometimes situations are hard situations that we would not choose. But we put ourselves under the lordship of Christ. That's called submission. Those of us who like to control things have a hard time with submission. It's difficult, but under the Lordship of Christ, every situation can be different. Surrender ourselves to his plan and his purposes. Uh, this has overtones of dying to self, doesn't it? Surrendering ourselves to him means we have to set self aside. We have to die to who we are, to what we want, to what we desire, in order to uplift His plan and His purposes. Actively seek God in His direction. I believe this is what we need to do individually as, uh, as individual believers. 
I believe it's also what we need to do as the body of Christ. If we want to really identify the will and the plan and the purposes of God for Clearview Community Church, I believe we need to be serious about our prayer time and commitment to Him and to pray and to seek His face. You know what God says? He says, seek me and you, and you seek me with all of your heart. What does He tell us? He will be found. Woohoo! He will be found when we seek Him with all of our heart. What does that mean? With everything. With the entirety of our being. We cannot compartmentalize our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, well, He's here for Sunday morning. No, that's not what it's about. He is here for everything. Everything in the believer's life. Seek God in His direction. We need to do this. And watch where God is working. And join Him in what He's already doing. And again, this takes a spiritual awareness. And it only comes through prayer and through the Word of God and through a, a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit where God begins to speak to us and lead us and show us, reveal to us where He's working, what He is doing. And then we join Him in what He's doing. In that, there is huge success. Huge success. And again, it's become less and less of ourselves and more and more of Him. Our success as individual believers and as His church depends of our letting go and allowing God to work. Letting go of self. The hardest thing we can do, that's the hardest venture there is for any Christian, is to let go of themselves and allow God to be the God He wants to be. Father, as we come, we just ask blessing upon Your people. We ask Your encouragement to be given to us, Lord, because we confess we need You. We need You more than anything else. And Father, as we come, we just ask You to continue to speak into our lives, to continue to stir in us, heal us, Lord, restore us, renew us, help us, Lord, if we need to repent and turn around and go the other direction. God, just help us to be faithful to, to, to you in everything that we do. And we ask this for the glory of the Father in heaven. Amen. I think we have a final song and then we'll close off the service for the online portion. Stand or sit, whatever you want.
lover, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. Do you? as we huddle together as the body of Christ. So blessings to each of those that have joined us online today, and may you know the Lord your God, and may he enrich your life. Amen.